The Rise Today Inspirational Podcast is brought to you by two relentless health warriors. Dr. Erica Harris, an empowered mindset health expert, who is the passionate founder of risetoday.com. And Megan Hubner, an entrepreneurial marketing strategist and founder of Hubner Marketing. These two inspirational forces have truly thrived through adversity and are here to empower you to do the same. Together, they serve to open up the conversation about hardship and to move you to greatness through your adversities. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. Now, let's get started. Let's rise today, right here, right now. It's a good day! Welcome back. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Welcome to the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast, where we serve to open up the conversation about hardship and share tools to stay the course and to even come to thrive through adversity. We hope you loved our last episode where we opened up the conversation about anorexia and confidence in terms of body image. We hope you found strength and inspiration and courage from Stephanie Kina's open telling in that episode. We are so honored today to have Sharon Musket with us. She is Australia's leading expert in loss, grief, and healing. She is the founder of the Love and Death Movement, and she's creating a worldwide movement in changing the way people view death and grief. Sharon and I met um, a few years ago when we were both speaking on stage in Las Vegas at a women's empowerment event, and I was so inspired by her work that I've invited her on the show, and I'm so honored she is here. Megan, can you help me introduce her? Yes. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Sharon. We are so happy to have you on the show today. You know, when I was doing a little bit of research on the topics that you cover and things like that, um, you know, I think one of the things that you really help people with is bringing awareness to the topic of death. And that is something that we don't talk about that often. So I am so excited to hear from you today as to how you got into this line of work, you know, the kind of inspiration that you provide families moving ahead and kind of where you're at today. So I know that you weren't always a a specialist in this area. So maybe you can take us back and tell us kind of what prompted this um, career change, if you would. Yeah, sure. And thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and being able to share what I do and why uh, the work is so important to me. Mm -hmm. So if you pass your mind back, it was 16 years ago, I was actually living overseas. I'm from Adelaide, Australia. And that's where I currently are now. But I was living over in London and I had um, what I thought was the dream job. I was traveling the, the world in PR and marketing. And I was working for a global wine company and living the high life. I was single and just, you know, very, very career driven. I didn't expect to have an accident, though. I had a freak accident one day. I was on a work trip. I was back to, in Adelaide, actually, at the time that it happened. And I stepped on the tail of a stingray. It went through the bottom of my foot. So I was on a popular Adelaide beach, Australian beach, and I was just paddling in the water, and there was a stingray. Now, if you cast your mind back, there was uh, Steve Irwin, who was the crocodile hunter. I don't know if oh, you've yeah, ever heard I do of him. Yeah. <laughs> he actually died very sadly from a stingray barb through his heart. Now, that happened to him two years after my accident. So we're talking about a very venom, venomous um, animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went through the bottom of my foot and my life changed completely from that point onwards. I uh, was in and out of hospital for the next two years. I was fighting to save the use of my foot. Um, They were talking about amputation. I faced death on two occasions because of it. I had to give up my corporate career. So, you know, I lost really in that moment, I lost everything, my financial security, my independence, Mm -hmm. everything. I was in a wheelchair for a long time. And I had a permanent pick line in my arm. Um, It turned the whites of my eyes orange. Like that's how strong the antibiotics, they just killed the infection, which was in turn was actually killing all the bone in my foot. So 
fast forward two years and I just got back on my feet. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time, but it was really six years in total before I was fully able to get back into any type of work wow. um, or anything. So in the time, I guess instinctively for me, because it was, you know, one of the most difficult times of my life, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when I faced uh, death. One, of, one occasion was a blood clot in the lung. The other one, I had a heart attack. So, you know, in my 30s, I was faced with both of those things. And it was just because my vital organs had were just shutting down to everything that, that had happened. Um, so I said to myself, you know, I'd always been one to be, to, to meditate. I was quite a spiritual person. I knew that whatever was happening to me was happening for a higher purpose. It was just something that was inbuilt in me. I thought I've been a big believer that life happens for you, not to you. So I I kept saying to myself, what is the learning in this? I guess I was trying to rush that a little bit because, you know, it took some time before it really came through. But um, I decided I would just do all the things that made me happy. That was the one way I could get myself emotionally through this every single day because I, you know, I went from working 60 hours a week. I was a workaholic to doing nothing. I could not move from my hospital bed. Um, So I took up things like knitting. I've Mm -hmm. always wanted to knit myself a scarf. So I did that. I wanted, I I wanted to learn how to sing. I, you know, I believe in a previous life, I must've been a singer. Um, because I can't sing now but I took up opera singing I hired this man to come into hospital and teach me how to sing opera and then and I'm still not very good at it (laughs) but I wanted a marriage celebrant I thought wouldn't it be cool to marry my friends and my nieces and you know people so I just studied that and it took about six months for me to do that I also took up more of my meditation. I learned how to do numerology. I became a Reiki instructor, you know, just anything I could do to keep myself active and, you know, emotionally um, and physically um, just able to get through such a tough time. So I'm going to pause for one second, Sharon, because I'm going to pause on this because it's so important what you're sharing in these tools as to how you stayed the course and how you changed this from having a static mindset of having no control over this period, right? right, To a growth mindset where you looked for these lessons that you could learn in adversity. And I think that's so important. And then you challenged yourself by learning all of these new skills. I really admire how you chose to embark on that journey. And I just wanted to pause and reflect on that for a quick moment. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I guess it was, you know, I came to a moment. There there were certainly times when I was, you know, I realised I was trying to control the situation. I was trying to get back to work. Like, you know, I didn't want to have to give up my job. And my employer, they were amazing. They had said to me, Sharon, we'll keep your job open as long as you need you know, we just want you back. And, but every time I was rushing to get myself back, um, you know, or they'd give me some work to do from home on my laptop, I'd get, I'd have another relapse and I'd get sick. And what I discovered was, you know, any tiny little bit of stress was having an impact on my body. And then I thought, I I just, I can't do it. I'm trying to control the situation. I can't, I have to Mm. surrender. So my big learning in all of that was when I surrendered to the situation that was happening to me. That is incredible. To go advice. and accept that there is learning in this. And it really was the time when I surrendered. And I remember at the time when I had my the blood clot, it was after my, because I had 11 surgeries with this um, injury. Mm. So I was just back in surgery all the time. And I think it was surgery number six where I had my, a blood clot and it was at that point that I just that was when I really let go and just said you know what if you have to take my foot take my foot I'm not going to hang on to this anymore do what needs to be done because I'm trying to control it and that's it. and it was when I surrendered and then just said I'm going to do everything that makes me just feel happy inside and that singing made my heart sing um, that's when it's, I started to heal. It was quite miraculous, really. Yeah, so after that, I 
became a marriage celebrant. And then my friend at that time, my friend's father just passed away. It was my best friend. And she said to me, well, you're a celebrant now. Could you come and perform the um, funeral service? So uh, instead of having a priest do it, here in Australia, it's very common that we have celebrants. So people that choose not to have a religious ceremony, but they still want it in a chapel, but just without the religious context. So they asked me if I would do that. Now, I'd never considered um, anything like that, being a funeral celebrant. But I, and I, I was really fearful, to be honest, of it, because I, I was scared about standing next to someone who was dead. I was worried about how was I going to react to that. So I, was, I made it all about me. I was so scared and could I do it? And what if I cry in front of people? And because I knew her father as well. And then I realised, Sharon, you're making this all about you. This is actually not even about you. This is about him and honouring him. And this is about my friend and her family and honouring them. Um, and this is about being of service. And you're here to be of service. And I have a skill and I can speak. And I love to, you know, like, you know, I love to, to you know, I always did public speaking in my role. So... Once I got over that and realised I'm here to be of service, I went and conducted that funeral service. Mm -hmm. I drove home after that service and just realised, and I said to myself, you have just lived on purpose. After everything I've done in my whole corporate career, for all of those years and travelled the world and, and you know all the money I could have possibly wanted, I never had the feeling that I had that day when I conducted that service. It, you know, all the money Incredible. in the world doesn't mean anything. It was when I found what I was here to do, and that was to be of service. And that was that I had a gift in being able to, uh, you know, I love writing. So, I, you know, we wrote a beautiful service. And, you know, and it was really that day that I discovered all about the love in depth. You know, like I saw, I see... You know, that, that day I saw in front of me love. All I saw was the outpouring of love to this person. And um, so that day happened to be the funeral director was uh, the state manager of a, of a very large um, funeral company here in Australasia. And he said to me, you know, that, that was amazing. Like, I've never heard anyone speak the way you speak uh, about death. And could we, you know could we use you? Could we contract you to do more? And I said, okay, not really knowing even what I was saying okay to, but sure. And, um, you know, it was six months later and I had conducted over 100 funeral services. Like it oh, wow. just it, it just went boom. And so now, fast forward, I've been doing this for over 10 years and I've worked now with thousands and thousands of individuals dealing with the realities of death and um, grief and I find it, it it's such a privilege this work for me it really is a great honor to be able to stand there before um, a family and friends and honor their loved one and um, yeah I, I love the work what yeah. an amazing so that was really my turn of events yeah yeah you're looking at your service and your contribution and how you're serving the world now it's it's, it's so beautiful Sharon and, and how you're contributing and I want to talk for a second on a lot of these tools that you just shared as well about staying the course right you talked a lot about surrendering and this this creating this space of vulnerability to be real about what was happening and you came to this point of acceptance right which is so important I think you kind of um, accepted where you were at at that moment versus where you wanted to be at at that moment and that's a process that we all go through when we're facing adversity and soaking into the power of now it's so important and it sounds like you just mastered that so well I get again I'm just really um thrilled that you've been able to share these incredible tools with our listeners and there are six basic needs of 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 life as we go through and two, two of which lead to us thriving and service is one of those that leads us to a life of 
thriving beyond adversity. And I think in your service and in your contribution, this is a big reason as to why you are thriving and looking so well and incredible before us. We're just really honored by your story. Yeah, I love I love how you shared just, you know, how your life had progressed from finding your true purpose and just, you know, focusing in on what you absolutely loved and what you loved got you to actually find your true purpose. And the thing is that, um, you know, I actually talked about this this morning is getting uncomfortable. So you were uncomfortable in that first service. And you were not sure how you were going to react and respond and stuff. And when you flip the script to actually say, hey, this isn't actually about me. I'm going to get uncomfortable in service to this, to this family. Um, you know, that's one thing that I, I feel like our society shies away from is getting uncomfortable. And that is where the true growth happens. And that leads you to finding what your purpose is today. Now, your movement is bigger than just you. Can you talk about your movement? I love your phrase, the love in death. I've read it over a few times to let it really sink in. And I love how you worded that. So what is your whole purpose with this global movement? Sure. Well, I guess um, really, you know, it, as I mentioned, it started to become very clear to me that death was all about love. You know, we talk about, well, really in our Western society, we tend to shy away from talking about death. We, you know, it's yeah. like the white elephant in the room. No one wants to go there. No one wants to talk about it. And, you know, what I see on the other end of that is when I meet with families and they don't know their loved one's wishes. They don't know anything. You know, then they're stressed and they're upset and they, because no one's had this conversation. But, you know, I... With each service that I do and have done, I would always walk away a different person. Like I would learn the most and I still do. You know, I did a service yesterday and I did one the day before and I'm doing one today. I walk away a changed person. I learn something new about how this person or how this family lives their life. But, you know, I would sit with the family and hear their most loving thoughts about this their loved one when they've passed so I'll sit with the man and I did this the other day he'd been married to his wife for over 70 years like you imagine that and he and I said to him take me back to when you first met and you should see the love that just poured out of his eyes and and I took him back on this trip down memory lane and for a moment there all the the sadness in his heart disappeared when he just filled with love and he told me how they shared this little milkshake together at a dance and all these beautiful things and I just go you know there's the love right there and so really it was about me trying to flip that so when they're in in a service I can share that love story with people and it's taking that pain away. And I talk to people about remembering all the, you know, the love and the, the stories and the memories. You know, I sit with a family who's lost their child and that is the most devastating thing you, for a family to have ever gone through. But I sit with them and I say, tell me about your love story. Where did it all begin? And tell me about the moment, you know, you first laid eyes on, on your child. Like, tell me about that. And you actually see them flip back to a beautiful, you know, it's a love story. So that's what I'm trying to create for people is the love. And it does not take away their pain. And, it, you know, and it, the healing still has to take place. But it's talking about that. You know, I sit with a family that's lost their parents and they share with me their love. I sit with a family in pure dysfunction and there's many families, sadly, in that state that I have to sit with. However, there is always a point in the service where I feel total peace and total love because it's what I'm trying to create mm -hmm. in amongst that. So I see me there actually as more of an instrument I'm there to just, you know, shower love and light and peace and healing over these people. And this is why I say it's so much bigger than me. So I really created the Love in Death movement as a way to change the conversation about death, having people focus more on the love. It will aid not only in their own healing, but by sharing love stories, it aids in other people's healing as well. Um, and I, I see that happen time and time again. Um, I can feel yes. it. I can feel it through your words. You know, when you think of all the past 
you know, people that you have loved and lost and I can really, really feel that. Um, now, one of the things you uh, mentioned briefly that I thought might be helpful is what type of um, tips or advice do you give to families that are, you know, that are trending towards end of life for a loved one, what types of things do you say is really helpful for you to help prepare? Like you had, you had made a mention there that um, sometimes they feel at loss if they haven't talked to their loved ones about what they actually want from a celebration or a burial or. So yeah, I guess in families, I, I just give them tips on how to sit down and just have that conversation and sometimes you know one of the biggest regrets people have you know when their loved one passes or after they've passed they will say to me I never sat down and found out where they went to school or I didn't know about their childhood or I didn't so I say to them you know what just grab your phone like get your phone mm -hmm. out and just report them ask them a question and say granddad you know what tell me about when you went to school what was your favourite thing about school? Granddad, tell me your favourite thing that happened in childhood. Granddad, tell me your first job. Just record it. And then you've got this record for the rest of your life as well. You've got them recorded. So mm. it's more, again, taking that focus off the death and remembering the stories. Like, Grandpa, tell me about when you met Grandma. What happened? You know, and it's just, um, you know, that's the best way for people to have a record. Mm -hmm. to remember and then they feel so happy that they've got all these recordings on their phone so they can look back when they're missing them as well um, the other thing I tell people is just grab yourself a journal and just write you know ask questions and write or you know someone who is grieving the, the loss of a loved one um, I always encourage them to get a journal and that can be your journal and use that as love letters you know, every day if you feel like it or whenever you feel inclined, write them a love letter like they're still with you because really mm -hmm. they are still with you. They're just, like they're that. inside your heart. The love's still there. The love does not go anywhere once they, they go. It's just physically we can't see them. But write to them and they'll hear you and you will hear them back. They'll send you little messages. It so just sounds like you, it's you, ha you have so many tools to help those who are experiencing loss and grieving. and and this impacts everyone worldwide, right? And these tools that you that you serve bring inner peace and almost change the focus point from the hurt and the missing and the longing to those actual smiles that come from remembering those beautiful moments in love. And what a gift you're offering, Sharon. Thank you. Really you know, beautiful. we look at, you know, there's five stages of growth grief and then you know then they are say the seven stages and you know the anger and denial you know the bargaining there's a lot of different things but if you look at them that they all have a negative connotation now it is true we all actually go through we go through all of them but if we focus like right I'm in the angry stage you know you know <laughs> if we say right I'm angry what <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is you know, just show people that, yes, you can still go through your anger stage, but let's think about the love. Like, let's, you know, it's almost flip, flipping the, the switch and going, let's go back to love. You create these mindset shifts, which is so essential for us all facing adversity, whether it's loss or whether it's facing cancer. These mindset shifts are so important where we allow ourselves the space to feel it right? And feel the hurt and feel the loss. But then we allow ourselves the ability to shift from that. And your tools that you're sharing with us really create, help create that shift when we're then shifting our mindset from that hurt, as we talked about, to then really centering on, on these smiles and the love. And these mindset shifts really help us stay the course and truly thrive and maximize each day that we have. These tools are really important, Sharon. Thank you. No. Four years ago, I went through a marriage breakdown and, you know, so I had my life back on track and it was amazing and I'm the mother of two boys and then this just hit me out of left field and, you know, it was such a shock to me and, you know, my whole life, you know, as so many people have been through, it gets turned upside down and I remember there were days where I, you know, literally just didn't even want to get out of bed 
but I would do it because I was being of service to my children. So I would get them up, get them to school, you know, and then I just wanted to come home. And, you know, the thing was, then I'd get a phone call from a funeral and they'd say, Sharon, um, a family's just lost a child. You know, can you do the service this Friday? Or, you know, a family's just lost their mother. Can you do the service on Thursday? And, you know, that instantly would get me out of being all about me. And, and then I would go, of course I can. Because, you know what, there's always someone going through something worse than you. And that's what I, it kept reminding me was, you know, we all go through adversity. And, yes, it's not great either. But for a moment, you know, the work that I do, it actually allowed me by being of service to get out of what was happening in my life truly be there for someone else fill my heart with that and then I could go back into my situation again but it was this constant reminder that you know there's always someone going through something worse and it's not about you we're here to be of service that's what I truly believe we're here for I lo- I really love that motto and I love how you really have taken ownership of that and really just give you know given all of your strength and your energy into it so that you um you can really continue to help other people. Like you said, it's not about me and my feeling not good today. It's about, okay, how can I continue to give back? And through the beauty of giving back, you lift yourself and others up. And that is really like the human connection is so key. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, the birth, the death or the, all the stuff in between, right? It's the, just the giving back and the receiving and the building community and, you know, finding strength from surrounding when you don't have it within and finding it from within to give to your surroundings when it's you know most needed and things so where can all of our listeners find you i know that you are based in australia i'm assuming you wouldn't be able to make a service in british columbia canada but (laughs) how do our listeners find you online so website so sharonmusker.com okay uh and musker i'll spell it for you because everyone spells it wrong (laughs) M-U-S-C-E-T, SharonMusket.com, is the best place to contact me. Have a look at the work that I do. Um, You know, I'm a professional speaker, so I do speak on, you know, up until COVID, I was speaking (laughs) on the professional circuit. Now it tends to be more online. But, you know, I'm loving it. You know, I'm getting more time at home. But speaking on grief and loss and death, the love in death movement, um, you know, I speak a lot to corporates. Mm-hmm. You know, grief and loss in the workplace is a occupational phenomenon, silent occupational phenomenon, really, because it impacts so many workers dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, any type of loss in the workplace. So, you know, I talk a lot with businesses about, you know, how to help and support workers, you know, so their pro- productivity doesn't suffer, but also that, you um, there's safe work environments for people as well. Yeah. So that's, you know, so yeah, through my website is the best way to get hold of me. There's a contact okay. me button there. And uh, yeah, but thank Your you. Your work is so important and can help so many rise after loss and heal through grief. I really admire all of your work. Just, just beautiful, Sharon. I think, you know, the tips and the tools that you helped all of the listeners with today, I think can go really far. You know, please, you know, if you're listening today and this is hitting home for you, or if you're listening today and you think that this could really benefit, Sharon's work can really benefit someone in your dear circle, please feel free to share her information, share the episode with people. We really want to open up that conversation and make sure that, you know, we switch that conversation from death to focusing on the love. And you can see the joy in Sharon's voice and, and in in her eyes if you're watching video on how that really lifts you up during that time so you know it's a it's an interesting topic today you you also shared with us your you know your life-threatening event that kind of led you to find your purpose and things so there's kind of twofold today that I really loved and I wasn't expecting so thank you so much for sharing all of your gifts all of your story and I hope that everyone uh, is leaving today feeling that whatever it is you guys can overcome it you can come through it you can focus on the love you can have your heart grow and your heart soar find a way to serve and rise today by lifting others 
Thanks for joining us on episode number 11. We appreciate your time, Sharon. Have a wonderful day, everyone, wherever you are listening to from in the world. I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time it is there. Thanks for joining us on the Rise Today inspirational podcast. We look forward to seeing you on our next coming episode, uh, which will be episode number 12. Have a great day. Have a great day. It's going to be a good day. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take this inspiration forward. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. And please do help us in our mission to spread hope, inspiration and positivity by encouraging those in your circle to join us and to tune in for our next show of inspiration coming soon. Please contact us if you have a powerful story to share with us to inspire the world. Until next time, get out there and rise today. Rise today.